to uh, introduce our next session, what it's called, which is titled, Should the NPPG Join the Royal Pharmaceutical Society? And what we are <coughs> proposing to do is a little light entertainment for you this morning um, to try and explore some of the issues around professionalism. I'd really appreciate it if we get lots of questions. It's going to be a fairly short uh, demonstration. Um, but actually then we want to open the floor up to everyone to get involved with this because it's very important that we discuss professionalism and the uh, impact of affiliation with our professional body and this is the opportunity to do it. So I shall welcome to the stage uh, our performers. <laughs> Child A. Child A was five years old when he suffered a life-threatening asthma attack. This asthma attack could have been prevented if it was not for the actions of Mr. Gooding, the defendant here today. He was responsible for the pharmaceutical care of Child A on the day of his discharge from hospital, just two days before this terrifying event. On that day, A had been a well, happy child was looking forward to going home and playing football with his brother. However, this man, he failed in his duty to ensure that child A was safely discharged with the medication that could have controlled his asthma You will see that the defendant had no proper knowledge of asthma devices or the clinical care of children. <coughs> this failure led directly to the severity of the asthma attack that nearly killed him, sending him to the paediatric intensive care unit for eight days, a terrifying event that still haunts him and his family. Mr. Gooding, I put it to you that you are not qualified to provide pharmaceutical care to children. You lack the appropriate knowledge of, tr of treatment of childhood asthma, and this led directly to the acute deterioration of child A following his discharge and his requirement for intensive care. Your Honour, my client, Nigel Gooding, has been a pharmacist for five years and for the last two of those years he has been a specialist and providing pharmaceutical services to paediatrics and neonates within his hospital. Um, I have numerous examples here um, of good character references from peers and managers at the trust that Mr. Gooding currently works at, stating that Mr. Gooding is, I quote, a very good pharmacist who cares for his patients and always acts in a professional manner. Along with his degree and the registration as a pharmacist, uh, my client also has a postgraduate clinical diploma in pharmacy practice, and this would be expected of someone in his position. I also have numerous examples again of lots of continuing professional development with evidence which we can show to the court, which confirms that over the last two years he has completed a large amount of continuing professional development, including a particular 
piece called known as a learning at lunch package, uh, which covered the treatment of asthma. I put it to you, Your Honour, that this is not a pharmacist who shows a lack of knowledge to safely discharge patient pain. Mr. Gooding, do you have anything to say to your defence? Yes, Your Honour. I've got plenty to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a specialist paediatric pharmacist. Well respected within the trust, well respected within my colleagues, consultants, I'm the golden boy of pharmacy. <laughs> I routinely review medication for children admitted to hospital with acute asthma attacks. This medication is very much standardised and as per national guidelines for practice. Patients often receive high doses of reliever medication, salbutamol, during their admissions and then will go home with reliever medication again, usually a salbutamol inhaler, often with steroids and potentially a steroid inhaler as well. These were all prescribed for this particular child. There was no problem with the prescription for this child. I checked the prescription, made sure all the doses were accurate, and then the hospital pharmacy dispensed the medication which was sent to the ward. I would have expected the nurse to discharge the patient with this medication and tell the parents and the child how that medication needed to be used. As already mentioned, I've got experience of asthma. I've done the training pack around asthma. And I've also submitted evidence regarding my continuing professional development where this was only requested by the General Pharmaceutical Council last year. That is all very well, Mr Gooding, but I put it to you that you do not understand your remit in patient care due to your failure to ensure the patient's carers were fully informed of the management plan for the use of these medicines and, most importantly, able to action it. The hospital pharmacy makes sure that there's really comprehensive labelling on the instructions that go up to the ward. And I made sure that all the doses on the discharge prescription were accurate. However, it was a really busy day. We were implementing e prescribing in the trust, and I needed to also get home early as it's which Tamble plan at home that night. <laughs> Your Honour, my client acted in a way that was totally inappropriate. I expected by him to describes the standards of education and training that prepare members of the profession with the particular knowledge and skills necessary to perform the role of that profession. In addition, most professionals are subject to strict codes of conduct, enshrining rigorous ethical and moral obligations. Professional standards of practice and ethics for a particular field are typically agreed upon and maintained through a widely recognised professional associations. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gooding, my good colleague on my right has stated that you are a member of the General Pharmaceutical Council and that you have a postgraduate diploma. But am I correct in thinking that this does not give you any specific qualification to state you are competent to provide pharmaceutical care to children such as Child A? Well, I'm qualified as a pharmacist. You can see those qualifications there. But I have to admit, I haven't got anything that specifically says I am a paediatric pharmacist. But it is my understanding that there is this professional leadership body called the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, which states their role is to lead and pro promote the advancement of science, practice and education, to shape and influence delivery of pharmacy services, 
to support and empower members to improve health outcomes through professional guidance, networks and resources. I understand that one of the ways they do this is to provide assessment and professional recognition through the RPS faculty, enabling pharmacists to gain recognition of their practice. So they are providing you with a mechanism to prove your competence within your area of practice. Mr. Goodick, are you a member of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society or the Royal Pharmaceutical Society faculty? Um, no, I'm not. Do you therefore have some other way that you are able to prove your competence to provide pharmaceutical care to children, such as the child in this case? Your Honour, my client has already confirmed that he undertaken this continuing professional development <coughs> and has documentation which has been assessed um, as by the necessary regulatory authority, which in this case is the General Pharmaceutical Council, to show that he has undertaken learning and development um, and has knowledge as a paediatric pharmacist. I understand that it says in, these, uh, uh, in the standards of the General Pharmaceutical Council that you're a member of, that you must only practice in areas of which you are competent. So I put it to you again, Mr. Gooding. How are you proving your competence to practice in this area? Your Honour, it is not mandatory for a pharmacist to be a member of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. My client cannot be held accountable for not being a faculty member of an organisation for which he does not have to be a member to practice his profession. If it is not mandatory for him to be a member of the RPS, um, then faculty membership cannot be mandatory to prove my client's competence. Mr. Gooding, please answer the original question from the prosecution. Why are you not a member of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and thus able to provide evidence of your competence? The costs are just so high to become a member of the RPS <laughs> and the time that you need to submit a portfolio. I've got a young family, a wife with really expensive high care fashion <laughs> tickets. I need to pay for my season ticket. The money's just gone. It's very hard. I felt that just by keeping up to date with my continuing practice development, that that would just be enough. Mr. Gooding, are you familiar with these RPS publications? I put to you in Exhibit A, the Professional Standards for Hospital Pharmacy Services, the Medicines Optimization, Good Practice Guide, and the Report on Keeping Patients Safe on Transfer Out to Hospital. Um. No, I don't think I've seen any of those, but I think they must have only just been published and I probably haven't got around to looking at those yet. Your Honour, lack of knowledge of particular documents cannot be held as proof of lack of care or professional knowledge. I'm sorry, but Mr Goody, while I can accept that you may not be able to quote verbatim from standards and guidance, would you not agree that your patients would expect you to be following the recommendations of your national leadership body <coughs> demonstrated in these documents. I would like to highlight these points. The pharmacy team should provide leadership in order that patients and their carers receive information about their medicines in a form they can understand <coughs> before discharge. It also quotes that your professional responsibility is to signpost or refer patients and their carers to sources of support for medicines use once they have been transferred. I put it to you, Mr Gooding, that you did not follow these standards when discharging child A. Furthermore, I would like to draw your honour's attention to the Bolan test, whereby a clinician is not guilty of negligence if they are acting in accordance with the practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of practitioners skilled in that art. I would like to sum up my case. <laughs> this is a simple case. It is about choices and professionalism. This case has shown you the defendant has deliberately chosen to shirk their professional responsibilities by not being able to by not becoming a member of this key professional association, he cannot prove his competence. He is unaware of the key standards produced by this organisation that would have provided him with better guidance as to the right route of care for this patient. I will therefore conclude he violated the duty of trust placed in him. He violated it because he believed his personal experience was a 
substitute for true professional development? By failing to learn from his peers and follow the standards of good practice available. Mr Gooding, by choosing not to belong to your professional body, you have failed to put your patients' interests first. <coughs> your Honour, I put it to you that the defendant, Mr Nigel Gooding, is guilty of unprofessional behaviour and poor practice. I would like to thank my learned friends on both sides, and I would like to turn to the jury. So, do you believe, put in the same circumstance, that would it be a benefit to you to be a member of the professional body? If you imagine yourselves in the dock, would it be a benefit to be part of the professional body or not? If you would like to say you should be a member of the professional body, please raise your hand now. <laughs> if you believe you shouldn't be a member of the professional body, please raise your hand now. <laughs> we'll debate that in a second. <laughs> Based on that, I'm going to sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gooding, you're going down. Thanks, I'm not my friends out there. <laughs>